Hi, my name is Austin Wobelov. I'm the product manager for developer tooling on Metaspark, our platform to enable creators and developers to build for the augmented layer of the metaverse. You may have learned in our other session about Metaspark Studio, our awesome tool for building augmented reality experiences, which includes a powerful visual creation flow, and virtual objects, one of the building blocks for the augmented layer of the metaverse. If not, you can check that session out in the links below to get a more in-depth understanding of what virtual objects are and how you can sign up for the beta program to start creating them. In this session, you'll learn how you can make more intricate and interactive virtual objects with code. We'll cover scripting, using TypeScript to define interactions for the virtual objects you build, shaders, using our dedicated shader language, SparkSL, to add more control over the rendering in your virtual objects, and finally, debugging, using our extension for VS Code to help debug your scripts. For this demo, we're going to create an interactive virtual object in the form of a timer, which can be placed on your home desk with MetaSpark Player or MetaQuest Pro, or other devices in the MetaQuest line. We'll show you how we've used scripting and shaders to enable a user to tap on the timer to increase the time by increments of five seconds. And if there's been no input for three seconds, the timer will start to count down with a pulsating effect. Once the timer reaches zero, it will explode into several pieces to catch the user's eye. To save time, we've already set up a basic project in Metaspark Studio with the assets needed for this demo already in place. Now, I'll hand over to Dunfan, who will give you a quick overview of the project and assets we're going to use. He will then show you how he used scripting and shaders to create an interactive timer before revealing the finished virtual object in Metaspark Player. Hello, my name is Dunfan Liu. I am a software engineer in Metaspark. Today, I'll be showing you how to use scripting and shaders to build a timer virtual object with a dramatic touch. Before we dive into the code, Let's have a quick look at the project setup in MetaSpark Studio. Inside the scene, we have an object named Timer, and it's composed of three child objects, front body, back body, and digits. The front body object is a plane that sits in front of the digits. It is mostly transparent at the rest state, but later on, we will use shaders to make it light up. The back body is a color plane that sits at the back, whose color is also controlled by custom shaders and digits consist of five additional child objects, including A, B, C, and D, for each of the four digits from left to right, and a column in the middle. Each of the aforementioned objects has its own material. So we have a front body material, a back body material, and one material for each of the digits. The front and back body materials are of the type shader asset, meaning that the materials are backed by some shader code. The materials for digits are of type flat, which is a simple built-in material type. The time displayed on the virtual object is determined by the texture applied to each of the digit materials, which is in turn controlled dynamically by a scripting. Let's have a look at like now at how that is achieved. We will use the TypeScript program to control the behavior of our timer. The script governs the internal state of the timer and controls the material properties and transformations that reflect this state. We begin with this timer state enum. The timer transitions between four different states. A rest state, for when the clock isn't ticking and the user is able to update the timer limit. A ready state, which is when the time limit has been set, but the countdown hasn't started. A ticking state, for when the clock is counting down. And finally, an exploding state, for after the timer counts down to zero and explodes. The timer state is used as a property of the timer class, which additionally keeps track of the current value of the timer as well as the time limits. Besides the timer state, the timer class also keeps handles to the scene objects which we just saw in Metaspark Studio. We have the timer objects, the material handles for the body and the digits, an array of textures for the numbers 0 to 9, and some animation clips and controllers. The scene handles are created in the getHandles method, which we show on this slide. 
Handles are created using a string representing their name, and is returned from a promise. The scene handle gives our script the ability to control the appearances of objects in the scene. As an example, when the timer is counting down, the digits displayed by the virtual objects need to update on each second. This is realized by the update timer class function shown here. For each of the four digits a, b, c, and d, the function computes the digit between 0 and 9 that should be displayed at this slot and retrieves the texture showing that digit. The texture is then applied to the material corresponding to the digit slot. We've seen how to update the digits on the timer, but having numbers that change isn't all that exciting. Next up, we'll add color variations to the timer to indicate the change of state and provide feedback for user inputs. We will implement three color variations. On the left, we have the green pulse of light that gets emitted when the user increases the time limit. In the middle, we have the color transition from blue to orange when the timer enters the ready to count down state. On the right, we have the accelerating red pulse that accompanies the timer's ticking. To implement these color variations, we will use shaders. In our shader code, we begin by assigning a tint color for each of the possible states of the timer. The tint will be the dominant color of the timer in that state. For the resting state, we'll use blue. For the ready and ticking state, we'll use orange. And in the exploding state, we'll use red. Spark's VS Code extension recognizes that these VEC3 values are colors and displays a small color indicator next to it. If you click on the color square, you'll even get a color picker that automatically updates the VEC3 values for you. The shader takes as input the state and the float named transition, which is a signal varying from 0 to 1, indicating the progress of the state transition. The shader also receives an optional texture as input, which defines the color pattern applied to the timer. Also, since this is a fragment shader, we'll declare color as an output. Inside the main function, we begin by sampling the base color texture. We do this by first retrieving the UV of the current fragment, which we write as fragment of get vertex text chord, meaning that the UV is an interpolation of vertex texture coordinates onto individual fragments. We sample the texture using this UV, and since we have an optional texture, we provide a fallback value using value or. We create a temporary variable alpha, which stores the alpha channel of the sampled color. Then we call the get tint function previously defined to retrieve the dominant color of the current state. In order to implement the aforementioned color variations, we modify the tint based on the state of the timer and the transition progress. For the first animation, we implement the light pulse as a circle with increasing radius and diminishing brightness. The implementation uses an SDF circle function, which is part of SparkSL standard library. The cool thing about the SDF circle function is that given the circle's center and radius, it returns another function which can be applied again to produce a VAC2. That is a higher order function in a shader. The SDF value is used to compute the strength of light pulse at the current pixel, which we use to mix the tint and alpha values. Then we have the other two color variations. For the transition from blue to orange when entering the ready state, we'll simply use a linear mixing. And for the red pulse that is sent when the clock is ticking, we'll use another SDF function with respect to a moving rectangle. Now that the tint has been computed, it's time to compute the final color. We could just use the tint as the final color, but doing so will lose details, such as the lightness variations from the original texture. For this reason, we need a function that, given the base color and the tint, applies the tint to the base color while preserving lightness. We could create a function that does this in this shader, but in fact, since this function is quite possibly reusable, it would be more scalable to create it in a different shader module. Spark SL supports linking multiple shader modules, each of which sits in its own .sca file. For this utility function, we create a module named colorUtils and create a new namespace called colors. Inside this namespace, we implement the apply tint method and mark it as export so that the other shader modules can use it. The apply tint function converts the RGB values of the base color and the tint color into HSL color space 
and combines the hue and saturation of the tints with the lightness of the base color. Notice that this color utils module also imports another module called color spaces. This is a Spark SL built in module that provides standard functions for color space conversions. Going back to our main shader, we import this newly created color utils module and call the apply tint function under the color's namespace to obtain the final color. There is a small edge case here. If the base color is fully transparent, it will usually have RGB color 000. In this situation, it's better to return the tint color directly. And this wraps up the shader code. And we'll move on to see how the scripting code passes the necessary state and transition signals to the shader. The TypeScript code passes data to the shaders by handles to the body materials which use those shaders. This is done by invoking the set parameter method of the material handles, which we do here in a set body material parameter function. In the timer class, we already have a set state method, which is used to update the state property within the timer class. So we'll add a call to set body material parameter here so that every state change is also synchronized to the shader. In addition to the state, the shader also requires a transition signal generated via the getTransitionSignal method here. This method receives a duration in milliseconds and creates a linear animation signal from 0 to 1 within this duration. To send the transition signal, all we have to do is call getTransitionSignal once to get a signal and call setBodyMaterialParameter once to upload it. The value of the signal is automatically updated by the animation driver and then synchronized to the shader on each frame. We have now completed the code needed for the color variations. But I'd also like to build some tension for the final explosion. And I'd like to do that by adding an increasingly stronger oscillation to the timer. This can be implemented in the vertex shader, but another great way of doing it is via the Spark Entity Components experimental package in the AR library. This package provides reusable components and an in-frame API. In the script, we will create a component called oscillation component. The component will have two properties, including a magnitude for the oscillation and a transform component, which this oscillation component will manipulate. The transform component is created in the onCreate method, which gets or adds a transform component on the same C entity that the oscillation component is attached to. To actuate the oscillation, we implement the onFrame method for the component, which will be called every frame. We compute a sinusoidal displacement in each of the x, y, and z directions and apply it to the transform component. We now need to attach an instance of the oscillation component onto the timer. We add a property in the timer class, and within the getHandles method, we create a sync entity for the timer. And then we create an oscillation component attached to that entity. To control the magnitude of the oscillation, we simply update the magnitude property of that component. As an example, in the onTick method, which gets called every second during the countdown, we compute the progress of the countdown and update the magnitude accordingly. At last, we arrive at the grand finale where we implement the explosion effects. There are two parts to this. Firstly, we explode the timer when the countdown gets down to zero. And then we reassemble the pieces back to a timer so that it can be used again. Though it looks complex, the explosion effect is extremely simple to implement in code if you have the animations baked as ready-to-use animation assets. For our virtual object, we have two animation clips one for the explosion and one for the reassembly. And all we have to do is use Spark's API to ask the animation controller to play these clips. That's it. And that's how we use code to create a cool explosive timer. The virtual object can now be mirrored to the MetaSpark player, and this is how it'll look. You can see the color variations as the timer state changes, the shaking of the timer as it counts down, and of course, the explosion at the end. It is great to see the timer virtual object fully functional after all of our hard work. Creating virtual objects through code is fun, but it can also be frustrating when there is a bug. Luckily, we have the MetaSpark Studio plugin for VS Code, 
which comes with the debugger. All you have to do is download the plugin from the marketplace and enter the Run and Debug panel and click the Run button. You can then add breakpoints, inspect variables, step in, over, and out. And now you know how to build amazing virtual objects with scripting and shaders. We look forward to seeing what you will create. Thanks for spending time with us today to learn how you can make more intricate and interactive virtual objects with code. As of Connect 2022, virtual object creation for MetaSpark Studio can only be accessed through our beta program. You'll need to sign up to learn more and get access. We look forward to working closely with you to continuously innovate, build, and test new virtual object functionality.